Hello and welcome to this video on low polygon modeling. In this case, I'm modeling a low polygon version of a bear, and this is for a mobile game that I'm working on. Now, the trick I do is I create a silhouette for the bear, a shape for the bear first, and that's going to help me have a guide. Modeling animals can be difficult, but there's also plenty of reference. But in this case, I'm not really using any reference because I don't want to be su uh, jumping from one uh, screen to another or from one image to another. So what I'm basically creating here is just sort of a wireframe in splines of how I want the mesh to be. And the, the reason I do this is because I sort of have a fairly good idea of what I can and can't do in 3D. So I sort of create that as a guide for me. Now, I want the cylinder that's going to build up the body to be able to split down in half. And I wanted to have enough segments to follow along with the silhouette that I created. So after I create that, I rotate it so that the edge uh, where I'm going to cut it in half is aligned with the top and back view. I actually delete it, but I changed my mind because having the whole model is actually quite helpful for this sort of loop scaling. And all I do now is basically move the loops into the place where I put them in the silhouette when I drew the spline. And now I scale them accordingly uh, with the silhouette. Some of them need to move as the, the pivot for that specific section of the body of the bear is a little different. So I move that around just a little bit. And the same with, uh, with uh, the nose here. Now, once I'm done, now I can create the connections on the front and back, and I can split the model in half. But I do make a few adjustments on the scales just to sort of have an idea of the shape being a little more bear-like. I like modeling with no smoothing groups on. Uh, it gives me a good idea of where my model is. Now, I want to extrude the leg out from that polygon, but I have to adjust the mesh before. This is still a four-sided cylinder and I'm going to change that by adding connections from the top edge to the bottom edge of the leg and that gives me an octagon shape so um, an eight-sided cylinder uh, and I add an extra loop up there there's an extra loop that I wanted to add there but I'm not going to add it until I make the back leg because I'm probably going to make those loops sort of connect in a way to make the mesh a little cleaner this will need to be animated so I have to make sure I have enough, enough sections I do those uh, fangs there or the claws there just as a just as a, a, a note and eventually I actually end up doing them so that cut I did there was just to make sure that the leg will fold once I start animating it um, and now with this uh, on both sides it, it kind of looks like um, an ant eater a little bit so I'm trying to change the face here before I, I go into the back leg now this is going to be the whole bit that I'm going to extrude for the back leg but I do want it to have to make sense in terms of uh, geometry and topology because the back leg would be a little wider from the side, but also um, a little wider from the front, but a lot more from the side. So because I already had this eight sided uh, shape because I was extruding a little bit more polygons in the front leg, all I had to do was make sure that the bottom was at least oval, you know, rounded in a, in a way that it didn't look like a a distorted uh, set of polygons. I, I, I duplicate some of these polygons here to make a, a tail. Not really sure what a bear tail looked like at this point. I really didn't want to go out and look in Google. It's something I can easily change afterwards, but it, uh, it worked fine for me. I think it looks, looked uh, decent. Now for the, the back legs here, the, the folding is a little different, so I had to make a couple of connections, and, and it's a little hard to see when I just have this in wireframe view. Uh, but it was easier for me to have a look at what the original spline that I drew was. And that's one of the reasons why I don't really uh, use blueprints all that much, because you have to have your model either in transparency or you have to have the blueprints in spline. Because once you go into that wireframe view, uh, the, the blueprint goes away. And I really don't want to have that as a viewport background because I zoom in and pan a lot. And setting up the whole thing is just annoying. Now, to make sure I can fold the leg on the body as well, I add another loop where the leg meets the body. And in this case, what I'm doing is I'm uh, uh, sort of duplicating this polygon here to act as the ears for the bear. I add a few chamfers here. There you go. Uh, on the, the ears itself, just uh, themselves, just to, to make a little more rounded off. Again, this is uh, based on the shape of a bear, but it's meant to be both... Um, well, it's meant to look like a bear, so it's not really realistic because it is meant to stay polygonal, to be displayed in the game as a group of polygons. But it also can't look like a, like a teddy bear, you know what I mean? So it, it kind of has to be 
uh, with the eyes here, it kind of looked comical, and I was I was really happy with the fact that it did look comical because the game is supposed to be lighthearted and funny. So I kind of went like, you know what? I'm gonna leave it like this because I think it looks um, it looks cool. Uh, there's a few movement here and there because I really don't want the guy to have a specific expression, you know, being angry or sad. So I just make sure that I have a kind of a neutral expression, but it, it still looks like a bear. Uh, doing the inside of the mouth is fairly easy. It's just uh, splitting some polygons and then using, um, using connections and bridges to bring those um, polygons together and closing it up. And I'm going to do the same with the tongue. Not sure if it's just now. Now I'm adding the extra the extra loop at the top or the extra uh, chamfer at the top of the front leg so that I can uh, then animate it a little bit better. Every time I do a chamfer, 3D Studio Max actually goes in and tries to auto smooth all of my mesh because the chamfer deals with smoothing groups. Once you add a chamfer, it kind of has to figure out which smoothing group the new polygons that the chamfer will create are in. So uh, it does make it it does make it a little um, a little weird. You can keep your model absolutely no poly with no smoothing groups, and then the chamfer comes in and just de defines what you want. The, here I was just like, sort of explaining the mesh and how I could make it look a little bit more polygonal. Uh, in this case, I'm doing the tongue, which is a very weird piece because it's not going to be seen almost ever, except in kind of like portrait views or front views. Um, so it, it's really not that important in the overall aspect of the game, but when it does show up, it's right in front of you. So it's like the animals facing you. So you, you do need to have a tongue for the bear. Um, here I was just renaming the match, which is something that I didn't do. And at this point, and I think until the end of the video, I will not save this file once, which is one of the stupidest things you can do. And for some reason, I keep doing it all the time, and it's it's really stupid. Uh, gladly, Max does autosave each five seconds. So even if the, the software was to crash, which it does, uh, I would be absolutely fine because I would have the files. Now, once you get rid of your symmetry, you get rid of your other uh, instance model, which is the other way, um, facing the other way, you have to start by um, welding the edges together so that the two halves are just one piece. And in this case, what I'm doing for the materials is I'm creating a material that's going to be the sort of the main fur color. And then I'll make a few other materials which will represent the different uh, parts of the bear. So the nose, for example, uh, the bottom of the bear, the eyes, the eye color, in this case, the claws as well. And I'm modeling the claws here out of a few extrusions and moving, uh, moving vertices around um, so it's quite simple. The result is, I think it's fine. I don't think it's like mind bending, but I think it's a, it's, it looks fine as far as what um, f uh, claws would be on a polygonal model. Honestly, I, if this was, if the poly count was that important, if it wasn't just an aesthetic choice, I probably wouldn't even do the claws because they do take up um, a few polygons. So the ears are black, so I make a different material for that. And the nose is also black, so I do a different material. And then I have to do a black for the eyes and then one for the white of the eyes, which I duplicate, change the color, and there we go. Uh, until very recently, I used to use uh, multiple, um, a, a sub-object material, which is a material that is built up with other materials. And you apply the, you apply the, the, the sub-object material, you apply the, the the sort of the parent material to the object and then the object sorts itself out because it knows what, polygon, what polygons are meant to be what material and the great thing about that is that you um, you can make the materials first just close the, the, the material window and then work on your model and just change the IDs for the materials on the on the object and on the polygons and you see the changes right away with this process, what you do is you have to handpick the, poly the polygons that you want and then you drag the material over there and you have to be in sub-object mode so that it creates different IDs. So it's pretty much the same. What, what it becomes simpler actually complicates the other aspects of the model attribution, but it cleans up your model, your model view, or your material view, that is. So now we're creating the texture coordinates for the bear. 
because we do want to bake the, the the color of the bear and the the ambient occlusion and the lighting we want to bake that on a texture so that we don't need to worry about uh dynamic lighting in the game because again it's a mobile game it's going to cost you a lot of processing power so what we're doing here is pretty much the process of actually skinning a, an animal which is cutting it in half and then spreading it out on the floor almost like a, a real bear rug would be it actually is called pelt the difference here is that we want to take the face away as well so this looks like i think what i said was breaking bad bear well in this case breaking bear uh, because it looks like it has one of those EV suits um, on him. So this is the texture, the texture editor, and this is the, the whole body just spread out. And these are the polygons for the feet, and I just planned those, and those are pretty much done. I, I mean, there's almost no secret to those. And uh, what I'm left is with the face, the ears, and the, um, and the tail. For the face itself, I keep the eyes away because... It's the way that we did all the other animals is we separate the eyes from the UVW texture. And here it's a matter of relaxing and repositioning stuff. And what I do is I play around with the settings so, so that it, it works at a slower speed so that I can take a snapshot at that precise moment that I wanted. Here what I'm doing is I'm previewing the resolution of the texture. If you find that your model has different checkers scales in different parts of the model, it means that the texture is using different resolutions. So for example, the, the, if the head has a lot smaller uh, squares and checker patterns on it, it means that it's using up more texture space than the body. And if you want to have pixel continuity so that the different aspects or different parts of the texture have the same resolution, you want to keep that checkered texture pretty much stable in terms of size. Now for the tongue here, I was kind of playing around with it, but the mesh is split. And I think I didn't even care about just joining it. I just went for, you know, just texture it. It'll, it'll be fine, uh, which probably won't. Probably we'll have to remake that as the, again, as the tongue is probably fairly important or will be noticeable once we put a camera looking at it. Now, for getting the, um, for getting the ambient occlusion effect, what I do is I put in a skylight. And as you can see, that render is not really interesting. This is flat, but this right here has the ambient occlusion effect and that's what i'm looking for for my texture and i put the ground underneath the object so that it does create a texture so that the object uh, becomes darker underneath but if i take it away it's actually too bright so i change the shape here of the ground to give me a little bit more shadow on the sides of the model so that i can see all the polygons that make up the 3d model of the bear now, to, to bake a texture, what I do is I plan or uh, sort of um, organize all of these elements of the texture on the coordinates. And once I'm ready with that, all I have to do is really just bake a texture using the render to texture uh, utility in 3D Studio Max, which is just, it takes whatever I want from the texture channel. So let's say I want the diffuse channel. I can bake a texture with that. In this case, I want a complete map, which includes the diffuse, includes the color, includes everything else now this saves up an alpha channel as well which is convenient and what i can do now is just attribute that uh, texture that i just rendered onto a material the material is then um, set to have uh, self light is of a hundred percent so it's self-illuminated uh, and once it's self-illuminated you really don't need uh, even to render it you can just see the material the object in the viewport like if it was rendered. So that's usually my process. This took about, I think, 15, 55 minutes, which isn't long, but it's, um, but it's a kind of an easy process if you just follow the steps and you're really um, attentive to it and you're not rushing it on anything. So I hope you guys enjoy this. Uh, take care.